Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will look at some cases where instrumental conditioning doesn't go as planned. We already saw some examples of this in the lesson on instrumental conditioning, but the examples here will be even more striking. Through learning, animals can acquire knowledge that they do not have innately. In this context, the typical interpretation is that Pavlovian learning is a way to acquire knowledge about the external world, and instrumental learning is about the consequence of one's own action. However, we have already seen a couple of examples where learning does not seem to work as well as it should. In our lesson on instrumental learning, we saw that a given reinforcer, like food or water, is not effective on every behavior. This means that animals are unable to learn some connections between their actions and their outcomes. In our lesson on auto-shaping, we saw that there are Pavlovian conditioning situations where animals develop unnecessary and even counterproductive behavior. You can review those two lessons to refresh those findings. Here we will look at some more cases of learning going wrong, so to speak, and try to interpret them. Our point of departure will be a famous article published in 1961 by Keller and Marion Brillant. Here seen with a rabbit, they had trained to play piano. The Brillant were professional animal trainers. They studied with Skinner and were responsible for many technical advances in instrumental conditioning methods. At some point, they realized that there was a lot of demand for training animals for commercials, entertainments, and other uses. Around 1940, they founded a company called Animal Behavior Enterprises. After almost 20 years of activity, they published the article The Misbehavior of Organisms. The title is a pun on Skinner's seminal book, The Behavior of Organisms. In this book, Skinner explored how reinforcement shapes animal behavior. In their article, the brilliance pointed out that an animal's natural instincts can interfere with the operation of reinforcers. One of the examples in the brilliant paper told the story of a commercial exhibit they put up, featuring a dancing chicken. This is a period postcard of that exhibit from the 1950s. A chicken is housed in a compartment that you can see on the right, where the window is, and the exhibit starts with the door opening. As the door opens, the chicken comes out, pecks at the jukebox to start some music, and then goes to the dance floor and dances. Thanks to the preservation efforts, of Bob Bailey of Animal Behavior Enterprises and Drs. Beam, Lammers, Gillespie, and Huffman at the University of Central Arkansas, we even have a video of that. You might have seen in the video that the chicken ducks its head, and this, of course, is because it was looking for a food reward. All of this behavior was trained with food as a reward. In fact, this is a pretty advanced example of instrumental training in that the animal is trained to perform a whole sequence of behavior rather than just one action. In a future lesson, we'll see in more detail how one can do this. For now, we are more interested in the backstory that the brilliants tell in their paper. Initially, they wanted to train a chicken just to go on a platform and wait there for a few seconds. They rewarded the chicken with food for standing still, but this did not work well. About 25% of the chickens they tried started pecking at the floor, even if there was no food there. This is a bit like what happens in auto-shaping, and you can go to that lesson to refresh your memory of auto-shaping. Even more chickens, about 50%, started scratching at the floor instead of standing still. At this point, the brilliance gave up training chickens to stand still, but they had the idea to rebrand the whole training procedure into the dancing chicken exhibit. Let's see two more examples before we draw some conclusions. The first example is a replication of another observation from the brilliant papers. They were training raccoons to deposit tokens in a bank. They also did the same training with a pig as an ad for a commercial bank, so that they could say that the pig was putting money in a piggy bank. The animals were rewarded with food for a correct performance, as you can see is being done here. In both cases, the raccoon and the pig, things went as planned in the beginning. The animal quickly learned to pick up the tokens, bring them to the bank, and drop them in. After some time, however, the animal was less and less inclined to let go of the tokens. The, the raccoon, as we can see here, started to play with the tokens, chew and manipulate them, and generally treat them as a precious object. 
The pig did similar things, but using its snout rather than its paws, which are not as capable as the raccoon. The second video is an example of rats playing basketball. This is from a competition held at Wofford College under the guidance of renowned experimental psychologist Alistair Reed. The competing teams of students have to train the rat to pick up the ball and put it into the hoop, and each dunk is rewarded with food. As we can see, even after a lot of training, the rats are conflicted between letting the ball drop and keeping it for themselves and chewing on it. Here is another good example of this phenomenon. So what can we conclude from these examples, which are all cases of what is called instinctive drift? The conclusion is that animals have their own instinctive ideas about what to do in certain situations. These ideas are called genetic predispositions because they are ultimately rooted in the animal's genes. For example, raccoons and rats think it's a good idea to hold on to objects that have been associated with food, and it's hard to train them to do otherwise. The reason why these instincts exist is that they work well in the animal's natural environment. It's unnatural for a raccoon or a rat to give away something to get food. Rather, they have to hold on to food sources, for example, a pine cone or a fruit. You may remember from our first lessons that these animals actually learn what to eat so that they do not have a strong idea of what food looks like. Maybe this is why they can learn to get attached to arbitrary objects like wooden tokens or plastic basketballs. They are genetically predisposed to like anything that comes before the pleasurable sensation of eating, because this is how to learn what to eat in nature, or in our garbage. We will continue to explore this theme in the class on how genes guide learning. This lesson is over. Happy learning to everyone.